Uh, he is a man that loves the Lord Jesus with all his heart. Uh, he loves his family, and he loves the United States. Um, he doesn't want to see the United States go down. And uh, he knows what the founding fathers knew, which is that an educated republic, you know, becomes a, a free republic. It's a free country if we're educated, if we know what we should know. Um, and too bad the whole nation doesn't know what he knows. Which is why I would encourage you, what you hear, pass on. Okay? He's passing it on to you today to pass on to others. That's why he's, he's put what he's put um, in written in audio form. Okay? So let's pray and then we'll invite him up. Father God, we thank you again for your servant, William Federer. We thank you that he is here. Again, he somehow was able to get here with the flights despite the temperature and across the state yesterday despite the weather. Thank you, God, for putting your hand under uh, his transportation and bringing him here to us once again. And we thank you for what we're about to hear, and we open our hearts right now. We're going to tell you, Father God, we're going to open our minds and our hearts to your truth, to real history, to a true biblical worldview, and um, to the man that you've chosen to Know what he knows and teach what he teaches the way he teaches it. And we thank you for him. God, thank you for Bill Federer. Thank you, God, that he's alive in our lifetime. I personally thank you. We thank you that he's here. He occupies the same time we do. And the difference that you have made through his life and his speaking, his teaching we give you glory for it in the name of Jesus because he's a servant of Jesus. And it's in his name we thank you and we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. Bill Federer. Thank you, Pastor Scott. Well, thank you, Pastor Scott, and I want you to know, Landmark Church family, how much I respect your pastor, Scott Craig, and join me in thanking the Lord for such a tremendous pastor right here in Rapid City, South Dakota. Well, I was driving across the state yesterday with um, Tana and Mike, and they're in charge of the, uh, Tana's in, the, in charge of the Minnehaha um, Republican Committee, anyway, I got to get that right. Um, but um, I looked at my weather app, and it was uh, minus 22, wind chill minus 53. And I thought to myself, this is probably the coldest place I've ever been. <laughs> and um, so thank you for coming out of the cold and into this warm church where we have the love of God. Amen. <laughs> Well, I thought I would share some stories of times in the past where America was facing crises. And we had leaders that called us to pray, seek the Lord, and do something. And so I have a, a PowerPoint, and um, I think I've got the, uh, the clicker working. Maybe if, if there's a way to... Okay. <laughs> Tony's working on it. Um, so uh, there we go. So the, um, that's my website, American Minute. We put together a book, Miracles in American History, my wife and I. And uh, World War I, it's a world war. Millions die. We have a president named Woodrow Wilson. He's a Democrat. And he passes out Gideon's New Testaments and Book of Psalms to all the soldiers in World War I. He writes the foreword to it, and General John J. Pershing writes another foreword to it. And this is what Woodrow Wilson wrote. He said, um, or this is one of his speeches, he says, This is the time for America. I hope that the clergymen will not think the theme of it an unworthy or inappropriate subject for comments and homilies from their pulpits. So he's urging the clergymen to talk about America being great and talk about God's call on America. And so this is what he writes in the foreword to that little New Testament. The Bible is the word of God, the word of life. I beg that you will read it and find this out for yourselves. When you read the Bible, you will know it is the word of God because you will have found in it the key to your own heart. 
Could you imagine a president passing out <laughs> Bibles and writing that in the foreword today? And um, so he gives an order to his troops. 1918, the president, commander in chief of the army and navy, enjoins observance of the Sabbath. The importance of man and beast of the prescribed weekly rest, sacred rights of Christian soldiers, the best sentiment of a Christian people demand that Sunday labor in the army and Navy be reduced to the measure of strict necessity. And so he evidently thinks that this is a Christian country and, uh, and he's definitely in favor of um, America uh, in our nation. Uh, I wonder if the left would call him a Christian nationalist. <laughs> and, uh, but back then they, they used the word patriotism, right? And so that everyone uh, in leadership encouraged Christian patriotism. And so he has a national day of fasting. Here's a president declaring a day of fasting when we enter World War I. In time of war, humbly to acknowledge our dependence on Almighty God and to implore his aid and protection, a day of public humiliation, prayer, and fasting. Exhort my fellow citizens of all faiths and creeds to assemble on that day in their several places of worship to pray Almighty God that he may forgive our sins. So the understanding in America was that God cannot bless sin. That if God blesses you while you're in sin, he would, in a sense, be saying that your sin is no big deal and he would be giving approval to your sin. And he would be denying his just nature. He would be denying himself. And God cannot deny himself. And so he has to judge the sin. And so they understood that if we repent of our sins, then God's free to bless us and not be denying his just nature. And so when you'd read these proclamations by the presidents, all the way from, uh, you know, James Madison had a day of fasting and prayer when the British burnt the White House. Um, Zachary Taylor had a day of fasting and prayer when there was a cholera epidemic that killed 150,000 Americans. Uh, Lincoln had two national days of fasting and prayer during the Civil War. But they would all say things like, we repent of our sins, we bemoan and wail our manifold transgressions. And Anyway, so a story from World War I. The Americans entered the war and were um, doing this trench warfare. My grandfather fought in World War I. And uh, he uh, had his gas mask, you know, and, and all the pile of paraphernalia. And, and when he died, my, we divided up all the family stuff. And, and my brother got my granddad's gas mask. I mean, it's like, I don't know how this thing worked, but it's got the two little goggles and it has this thing that goes onto this canister. I guess they had some carbon in there and they're like, breathe. it's like, you know, it, it, it um, I don't know how it could have saved anybody because it was, you know, I mean, the, your beard would, would keep it from being tight against your face. Anyway, so October 8th, 1918, American battalions pinned down by machine gun fire along the Decauville rail line north of chateau Chere, France. And there is a Sergeant Alvin York. And he writes, the Germans got us. They stopped us dead in our tracks. They're machine guns. We're up there on the heights overlooking us and well hidden. We couldn't tell for certain where the terrible heavy fire was coming from. Those machine guns were spitting fire, cutting down the undergrowth all around me. Well, all but eight of his entire group were killed. And he begins to shoot back at the machine gunners. And he uh, takes out 32 machine guns and kills 28 of the enemy. And he... Uh, was from Kentucky, Tennessee, backwoods, and he would turkey hunt. And he says that he would shoot at them, but then they wouldn't stick their heads up. And he said um, he'd make a turkey call, gobble, gobble, gobble. And the guy would stick his head up, boom, he'd shoot him. <laughs> and then he said, I could shoot better stand than up. So rather than down on the ground, he'd stand up and he'd make the noise, boom. <laughs> and, um, and then he was charged from behind with six guys with bayonets. And he turns and he's got his pistol and he goes, I shot him the way you shoot turkey you shoot the furthest away one first. Because if you shoot the closest one, the other ones will see it and scatter and you'll never get them. And then he turns back and he shoots back and finally a little white flag comes up and the Germans surrender. And um, they uh, questioned the story, right? And so later afterwards, um, in a more recent history, somebody went over there with a metal detector and went over to the Ch Chateau Charest, the area, and they, lo and behold, they find this one spot where there's like all these spent 
cartridges around in a semicircle around where he was. So he really did do this. And um, he captures 132 of the Germans single-handedly. And they're not about to run away because they know he can shoot them. And uh, the German commander comes down with these 132 men. And he, he says, uh, where, where are the others? <laughs> and there's like just Alvin York, maybe one other guy that crawls out of the, the bushes, you know. And, um, and he gets the Medal of Honor. And he says, some of them officers have been saying that I, being a mountain boy and accustomed to the woods, done all these things the right way just by instinct. I had never got much learning from books except the Bible. Maybe my instincts are more natural, but that ain't enough to account for the way I come out alive with all those German soldiers raining death on me. I'm a telling you, the hand of God must have been in that fight. Just think of them 30 machine guns raining fire on me, point blank range from only 25 yards, and them and all of them their rifles and pistols besides those bombs. And then those men charged me with fixed bayonets and I never receiving a scratch and bringing 132 prisoners, I have only got one explanation, that God must have heard my prayers. He comes back to America and he starts a Bible school. <laughs> and uh, the Sergeant York Bible School. And, uh, and Gary Cooper stars in a movie uh, about him. And uh, so this is a time in our country's past and somebody with faith and courage, and God protects him, and God uses him in a powerful way. And then there's Eddie Rickenbacker. He was a race car driver called Fast Eddie, you know, the Indianapolis 500, and he goes over, and he's a chauffeur for General John J. Pershing, the one who wrote the foreword to that little New Testament with Woodrow Wilson. And he's seeing these things in the sky, right, because airplanes were just invented, and he goes, I want to do that. And so... <laughs> He just stops doing that and goes over. He learns how to fly an airplane like on the spot. And then he ends up, he ends up being an ace. And his squadron uh, shoots down like, I don't know, dozens and dozens of the Germans. And they, he wrote a book called Fighting the Flying Circus. Because <laughs> you'd be like flying in circles and trying to catch them. And, um, so uh, in his book... He writes this, three quarters of an hour of gasoline remain and no compass. Then I thought the North Star, glory be, there she signs. I had been going west instead of south. Keeping the star behind my rudder, I flew south for 15 minutes, then found myself above the River Meuse, picked up our faithful searchlight, and 10 minutes later I landed. As I walked across the field to my bed, looked up and repeated most fervently, thank God. <laughs> and, um, and he said, I had seen others die brighter and more able than I. I knew there was a power. I believed in calling upon it for aid and guidance. I am not such an egotist as to believe that God has spared me because I am I. I believe there is work for me to do and that I am spared to do it just as you are. And uh, now he ended up becoming the biggest conservative radio voice in America. He had a radio show and he is conservative. He's coming out against, you know, the inflating of the currency and he's in favor of the gold standard and he's coming out against all the, the New Deal programs that FDR is talking about. And um, uh, so then World War II starts and he, uh, he was doing an NBC radio broadcast and he was like, slamming all the liberal policies of FDR and, and FDR called and had NBC cut off the radio program. And uh, anyway, he is given an assignment to help the military by flying out into the Pacific and inspecting some of the air, air bases in the Pacific during World War II. They take off and the compass was just a teeny bit off. But you go hundreds of miles in the oceans and a teeny bit off ends up being way off. And they run out of gas and they have to ditch the plane between the waves. And he said, the waves from up in the sky, the, the ocean looks really smooth. But he says, when you get down there and these waves are like 20 feet high. And so they have three little rafts. And uh, uh, the uh, one guy had died 
And then another guy was like wounded and depressed and he like uh, rolls over the side. And he's going to sink in the ocean. And Eddie Rickenbacker reaches in and grabs and throws him back in the raft. And he lets out a string of profanity. And the guy says, that Rickenbacker has quite a tongue in his head. Well, he, he's the oldest guy in the boat. If you remember, they used to teach the uh, situation ethics in school. If you have so many people in a boat and you only have enough food and you got to decide which one to shove over, who would you shove over? Well, the old guy. <laughs> he's he lived his life. Or, well, guess what? He's the oldest guy in the boat and he's the one that's keeping him alive. <laughs> and um, so they, uh, one guy had a pocket New Testament and uh, this FDR had given out New Testaments like Woodrow Wilson. And, uh, and Eddie Bick Rickenbacker tells him to start reading it. And he reads through Matthew, how, oh, ye little faith, and God provides for the birds, and he's going to provide for you. And he says, we were starving in the, uh, he wrote a book called um, Seven Came Through, and then one of the other guys in the boat wrote a book called We Thought We Heard the Angels Sing. And, and the other guy um, talked about how they were drying of, dying of thirst, and a cloud burst happens, like a quarter mile away. And they're like so weak in the tent and they pray and the cloudburst comes right over and he just drenches them and their parched lips and they, they, they wring out their clothes and they collect all the water and they survive. And, and then, uh, they were running out of food and a, uh, they pray and a seagull lands on Eddie Rickenbacker's head. <laughs> And really slowly, he reaches up and he grabs the thing and wrestles it and kills it. And they, uh, they, they eat the, the meat and then they um, take the innards. And the one guy has a key ring and they bend it and they uh, use it as a fishing hook. And they start catching fish and they're able to survive. And then they take their paddles and they beat off the sharks. And, um, and so this is what flight engineer private Johnny Bartek wrote in Life Out There, 1943, that on the eighth day they were starving after reading from the Bible, Matthew 6, 31 to 34. But as we went on, we all began to believe in the Bible, God in prayer. We prayed and prayed for the seagull to land so we could catch him. After reading the passage, about 20 minutes later, that's when the seagull landed on Eddie Rickenbacker's head. <laughs> Rickenbacker caught it, caught it, they used the food for fish bait and using a bent key ring as a fish hook. Rickenbacker said, after he is rescued, I pray to God every night of my life to be given the strength to inspire in others the obligation we owe to this land for the sake of future generations. For my boys and girls, so that we can look back when the candle of life burns low and say, thank God I've contributed my best to the land that has contributed so much to me. Isn't that a great story? And, uh, now, Europe, World War II, Nazis, they have uh, two massive Nazi armies. They drive back the British, French, Dutch, Polish, Belgian troops. Uh, they're pushing them up against the English Channel. They bottle them up in, at Dunkirk. This is May 1940. And uh, the, the British have their, what's left of their army on the shores. And they don't have boats to go over to the English Channel to the British side. And the Nazis could have finished off the British army right then. But for some unexplained reason, uh, Hitler has them wait. So the Nazis capture Paris and France surrenders. And then they basically conquer all of Europe. And um, Winston Churchill says, the Battle of France is over. I expect the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. And then Franklin Roosevelt says the same thing. Uh, I wrote a book called The Faith of FDR. I read through every address he gave while he was in public office. He was elected president four times. And you, uh, you, you say, why did you write a book on him? Well, he was the, a Democrat. So he was like the patron saint of the Democrat Party. And here he is. And I ran for Congress several times. And they would uh, well, you know, want to try to pigeonhole you as a right-wing fanatic. But it's like, here, I, I'm quoting from a Democrat. How can they call me? And so he said things like this. Preservation of these rights is vitally important to the whole future of Christian civilization. Right. And then you have uh, Pearl Harbor. We enter the war and uh, then we have D-Day and we have our troops land on the Normandy coast and 50 mile stretch. Uh, 
and they said that the water turned red with blood for all that were killed. This had 13,000 aircraft, 5,000 ships, nearly 200,000 Navy and 160,000 troops, 9,000 casualties. FDR had a D-Day prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, struggled to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization. What religion? Well, he passed out Gideon's New Testament and Book of Psalms to all the soldiers. And of course, he was Episcopalian. And, um, and he said, the whole, by the way, a friend of mine, Chris Long, he was a pastor in Ohio, and then he started the uh, Ohio Christian Alliance. And 20 years ago, and he would have banquets every year. And all the politicians would come. And it's this big banquet. I'm speaking for him again in February. And uh, he, uh, I sent out a daily email called American Minute. I did one on World War II. And I happened to notice that the World War II Memorial in D.C. did not have any mention of God. And, uh, but then I had some quotes of FDR. And so he goes to his congressman, uh, Bill Johnson, his senator, Rob Portman. And he gets him to introduce a bill to have a the Franklin Roosevelt's D-Day prayer added to the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. Uh, Obama was catching some heat, and since FDR was a Democrat, he signed it. But they couldn't raise money because it was a prayer, so he had to raise the money. And uh, anyway, they get, uh, it, were, it took him over 10 years. They had to raise several million dollars. And this last year, they dedicated the Circle of Remembrance right about 20 yards away from the World War II Memorial on the, the mall in Washington, D.C. And it has four bronze plaques with FDR's D-Day prayer in it. And it's the only place in the entire Washington, D.C. mall that's dedicated to a prayer. And um, anyway... So FDR says the whole world is divided... Between pagan brutality and the Christian ideal, we choose human freedom, which is the Christian ideal. Those forces hate democracy and Christianity as two phases of the same civilization. They oppose democracy because it is Christian. They oppose Christianity because it preaches democracy. And then this is the New Testament. He wrote the prologue too. I have a copy of it. He gave them brown ones to the army, blue ones to the navy. And he writes, uh, as commander-in-chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces of the United States. Throughout the centuries, men have found in the sacred book, Words of Wisdom, it's a fountain of strength, signed Franklin D. Roosevelt. And then he writes this, your government is working with representatives of Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish faith. Without these three, all three of them, things would not be so easy. And so the country at this time was 98% Christian about 69% Protestant, 24% Catholic, and then others, and then about 2% Jewish. And, uh, and so, Battle of the Bulge. So we land at D-Day, and we're pushing the Nazis back. And if you were to look at a map of Europe, you would see this line, and they're being pushed back toward Berlin. But then they want to make a mad dash to get to Antwerp, Holland. It's a port city to get ships with gas because they're running out of gas. And so if you were to look at the map, it, it has a bulge in it. It's got this line down, but now it's bulging out because they are got this blitzkrieg and they're going toward the coast. And there is a um, city in Belgium called Bastogne. Eight roads come together. It's strategic. And they ha have to get past that city in order to get to Antwerp. And uh, we drop in the 101st Airborne. And, um, but we drop them in Lo and behold, the Nazis have gone past them. Now they're behind enemy lines. And uh, Frank Eisenhower says, by rushing out of his fixed defenses, the enemy is, may give us the chance to turn his great gamble into his worst defeat. So I call upon every man of the allies to rise now to new heights of courage with unshakable faith in the cause for which we fight. We will, with God's help, go forward to our greatest victory. And so there's the 101st Airborne. and They're in Bastogne. The Nazis come to him and say, uh, you're surrounded, surrender. And General Anthony McAuliffe uh, tells the, uh, the Nazi messenger, nuts. <laughs> nuts. <laughs> I mean, uh, and, and that was what he told him. And so the Nazi messenger goes back to his commander. He goes, what does this American general say? He says, nuts. <laughs> hmm, does that mean yes? <laughs> And so the Nazis delay for a little while, and then they begin to pummel them. And while they're fighting them, uh, coming to the rescue is Patton, 
George Patton. He has got uh, the American Third Army, but he's pinned down uh, because of the snow, the messy rain, freezing, and the planes cannot fly and give cover for the troops to advance. And so he's pinned down. And so he gets his chaplain, James O'Neill, to compose a prayer. And if you've seen the movie Patton, um, the, the chaplain's like, well, I don't know if I can do this. And he goes, we, got, we, need, we need God's help. You know, do it. And so it's like, okay. And so he, he composes this prayer. They print it on a quarter of a million index cards with Patton's Christmas greeting to his troops on the flip side. They pass it out to the troops. My um, father-in-law, before he died, was in a nursing home. And, and all the guys would have their you know, World War II uh, uh, paraphernalia you know, up that they were proud of. And, and one guy had the card. And, and I saw it and I held it and I go, wow. And, uh, and so this is the, um, the card. And uh, so he, uh, they prayed the prayer and it says, um, Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate reigns. Hearken to us as soldiers to call upon thee, establish thy justice among men and nations. They pray the prayer, the sky clears the next day, the planes can fly, they come to the rescue of the 101st Airborne and then... Uh, the Nazis run out of gas. So about 20 years ago, I was speaking someplace and um, the, uh, the guy said that he fought at Bastogne. He says it was freezing cold. And we can relate to that. Um, they were trying to dig foxholes. The ground was like solid cement. They couldn't even dig into the ground. And, and they were like shivering and freezing. And he says that the Nazi tanks were getting closer and closer and closer and then they ran out of gas. Wow. And then the lid opens, clunk, clunk. Then the guy scurries up, right? And he gets away. And, and, and he says, there were just a, a cornfield away from us and all the tanks ran out of gas. And then the Nazis have to retreat, retreat, retreat back to Berlin. And in April of 1945 is when Hitler blows his brains out and the war's over. And um, so Eisenhower says this in 1954, because he was the general, the Supreme Allied Commander. He says, now any group that binds itself together to awaken us is a dedicated patriotic group that can well take the Bible in one hand, the flag in the other, and march ahead. Right. And uh, so one other story, <laughs> Apollo 13. Um, it uh, has an oxygen tank explode and it blows off a part of the uh, spacecraft. See the, the part is nice and smooth, and at the top you got a bunch of stuff, uh, right? That's not supposed to happen there. And so on Apollo, uh, April 11th, 1970, uh, shortly after the takeoff, uh, you hear this message, Houston, we've had a problem. <laughs> and um, I actually, uh, years ago, went hunting in South Dakota, uh, the Paul Nelson farm, um, uh, in, near Gettysburg, South Dakota. And one of the guys I was hunting with was Gary Sinise. And he's the actor, you know, Lieutenant Dan, you know, from Forrest Gump, but he was also in the Apollo 13 movie. And, uh, I said, now, how did you do those weightless scenes? You know, with the, the, the things were, you know, he took off his thing and it's just floating there. He goes, Oh, the vomit comet. <laughs> Evidently there's, they, they would fly this plane up to like, I don't know, 50,000 feet and then let it drop. And for two minutes, you would have weightlessness. And then they would have to do it again. And so the, the whole scene, they'd have to do over and over again. Up, and, then, and he says, you know, that anyway. Um, <laughs> but um, so they uh, piece together. So, so Nixon's the president. And Nixon calls for prayer. And uh, uh, the whole world's praying. They pray at the Wailing Wall. They pray at the Vatican. Uh, they're praying across America. Um, the, uh, here's a church in New York. And if you look at that marquee sign real close, it says, today, special prayer for Apollo 13. Everybody in the country and the world is praying. And then they piece, they're running out of oxygen. And so they have to piece together a bunch of parts to make an oxygen filter. And then there's not enough electricity in the main um, module to, to, to keep it going to get back to Earth. But they have a battery charge 
in the lunar craft that's supposed to land, but it never does because they never get to the moon. Um, and so they have to do all this complicated stuff to move the electrical charge out of the landing module back into the main uh, spacecraft. And, and then they, they uh, have to turn off the heat because um, you uh, don't want to waste this electricity on heat when you need it to steer. And, uh, and it gets very cold up there. So, um, and then they land it near a hurricane manually, and then they're rescued. Uh, and so the, uh, Nixon said, when we learned of the safe return of our astronauts, I asked that the nation observe a national day of prayer and thanksgiving today. This event reminds us that in these days of growing materialism, Deep down, there is still a great religious faith in this nation. I think more people prayed last week than have prayed in many years in this country. We pray, pray for assistance of God when faced with great potential tragedy. And there's a picture of them praying on the deck. And then if you look, this is the picture from Houston. And they're praying at the control center. And you can see the big screen on the wall of them praying on the deck. Right? And uh, so then you have Time Magazine. And the cover of it is the astronauts praying on deck. And uh, the little subtitle says, Astronauts Praying After Splashdown. And they have a coin they made, the Apollo 13, and when the whole world was praying. Now, Apollo 14 left a microfilm copy of the entire King James Bible on the moon. Right? So every little... The, dot there was a page and you have to zoom in and uh i uh and then there's apollo 15 and i spoke at the sarasota florida 50 50th anniversary mayor's prayer breakfast big room of people and all the uh officials and and uh one of the other speakers before me uh was the daughter of astronaut james Irwin, and his wife was there and uh and she tells the story. She says, if you look really close on the lunar module, on the, on the, 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 the roving uh, craft, that James Irwin left a Bible on the, uh, the dash of it. Um, so uh, he writes this. He says, being on the moon had a profound spiritual impact on my life. Before I entered space with the Apollo 15 mission in July of 1971, I was a silent Christian. But I feel the Lord sent me to the moon so I could return to the earth to share his son, Jesus Christ. He talks about being on the moon and being overwhelmed with the presence of the Lord. And, and all of a sudden, you know, he looks back at this little blue marble called the earth, you know. And, and, uh, um, and so uh, I love this quote from James Irwin. Jesus walking on the earth is more important than man walking on the moon. Yeah. And uh, now, in uh, when we see crises, we turn to the Lord. So the thought is, why did God make us, and uh, and he, why does He want us to turn to Him? And I uh, put together a new book. It's called Believe, and I go through how in two thousand and three they focused the powerful Hubble telescope on a spot in the sky where there was nothing. Tiny spot. It was the size of a grain of sand held between your fingers at arm's length against the night sky. Teeny little spot, nothing there. After 11 days, they developed the images. In that little spot where nothing was there was 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. And this is the picture. It's the Hubble Ultra Deep Space Field. It is the furthest picture ever taken away from planet Earth. This is not an artist's rendition. This is the furthest picture ever taken away from planet Earth. And now with the James Webb Telescope, you can see it even clearer. And they saw, and so every dot you see is a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. And they saw the red shift. So different galaxies have red. Well, light travels in waves, with blue being the shortest, fastest wave, and red being the slowest, longest wave. 
They saw the red shift, which means you're seeing the slow light. You're seeing, you're seeing these galaxies moving away from us. Then they began to look in other directions. They now estimate that the observable universe is 93 billion light years across and still expanding at the speed of light. And the largest star that they found is Stevenson 2 hyphen 18. It's a super gas giant. It is so large. If you were to place Stevenson 2 hyphen 18 in our solar system, it would engulf the orbit of Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. We are the third planet from the sun. Could you imagine one single star that enormous? And God made it all. And he made you. Why would he make you? What, what could you possibly offer a being that is that powerful? Nothing. Except maybe something. What's a galaxy anyway? It's a bunch of rocks. Hot rocks, cold rocks, vaporized rocks, molten rocks. A rock cannot love you. So it's almost like at some time in eternity past, God said, been there, done that. I can make everything I would really like someone in my image that could love me. Now it gets interesting because love by definition must be voluntary. The moment it's forced, it evaporates. If God were to force you to love him in any way, he himself would know he is forcing you to love him and he would know your response is not a love response. So he'll never force you. And so in this context of everything God controls, time, matter, space, energy, he intentionally created one tiny thing he does not control, your will. Now, he could control it if he wanted to, but that would defeat the very reason he made us different than everything else. And he doesn't need our love. He's not incomplete in our love, somehow completes him. He doesn't need our love, but he wants it. Parents don't need the love of their children, but they want it. And the more you love someone, the more you want that someone to love you back. God loves you infinitely. He has an infinite desire for you to love him back. But he'll never force you because the moment he would force you, he himself would know he's forcing you and he would know your response is not a love response. So he'll never force you. And um, so we are unique in that we can love God back. I mean, what's the most important thing in your life? Well, somewhere near the top of the list is loving and being loved. If we're made in his image, could it be that loving and being loved is a big deal to God? Yeah. Now, God loves everything he created. But the question is, could what he created love him back? Galaxies can't love. Rocks can't love. Animals follow instinct. I looked up the word angel in the King James Bible. It appears 289 times. Not one time is the word love used to describe an angel's relationship with God. They worship God. They praise God. They glorify God. The word angel means messenger. They deliver God's messages. They smite God's enemies like in Egypt. And, and they um, uh, are heavenly witnesses. Jesus says, I'll confess you before the angels. They rejoice when a sinner converts. They sang when the stars were created. They are mighty beings. They are incomprehensibly intelligent beings. But they're not made in the image of God. And Jesus did not die on the cross for angels. They were made for a purpose. What purpose were you made for? We're not very smart and we're not powerful. <laughs> Why would he make us? You know, a king can have a castle with really smart staff and really powerful soldiers. And then he can have children. Guess what? The word love is used all throughout the Bible to describe men and women's relationship with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. Psalms 91, because he said his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Jesus rose from the dead and said, Peter, do you love me? We are beings created with the unique ability to love God back. And, uh, so God created us to love him back, but there's a question. How can God give us free will to love him back, but yet he's still in control of everything? Well, God created light and light is a photon. 
which is a perpendicular wave in the electromagnetic field that travels at 186,000 miles per second. And visible light is one small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. You have ultraviolet rays and gamma rays and infrared rays and radio waves. And so when God stretched out the heavens, he also stretched out the electromagnetic field so light could travel across the heavens. And Einstein's theory of relativity is the closer you could travel approaching the speed of light, for you time would slow down. And if you could travel the speed of light, for you time would stand still. God created light. He's faster than light. So for God, time stands still. We'll never comprehend that. But there is a verse in the Bible that says, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Imagine experiencing one day as if it was a thousand years. In other words, we are living in slow motion compared to God. God exists in the ever present now. I am that I am. When you are in God's presence, you cannot think about the past. You cannot think about the future. You can't even think. You just experience. I'm in the presence of all love, irresistible love, terrible judgment, all awesomeness, all power, all intelligence, all eternity, right? You can't. So for God to create our reality, he had to create a little space-time bubble where everything moves in slow motion compared to now. He basically took now and stretched it out and slowed it down. Now, why is this important? Because we make our little free will decisions in time, but he's outside of time. He can readjust every electron in the universe before time moves forward to the next nano frame so that his will is going to take place. So it's our limited free will inside the context of his unlimited sovereign will. And it works because he's outside of time. A way of thinking of explaining it, we all have GPS on our phone. And you make a wrong turn, it recalculates. What if the guy in the car next to you makes a wrong turn at the same time and his is recalculating at the same time as yours? What if everybody in the city is making wrong turns and they're all recalculating at the exact same time? What if everybody in the world, right? So we make good decisions. We make bad decisions. God's outside of time. He readjusts every electron so that his will is going to take place. So it's our limited free will inside the context of his unlimited sovereign will. And we sort of know this inherently. Because if you're like with somebody and you say, wait a second, it's no coincidence that you and I are right together right now at this moment. That this is a providential moment. This is God ordained. That God has directed us. This is, the, and you feel the goosebumps of the presence of the Lord right there with you. That he arranged it. And God does have a perfect plan set out for your life. And if you yield to it, you will walk in it. We are his workmanship created for good works. But if you fudge a little bit and say, oh, I don't want to do, you, you, know, you can follow him 30, 60, or 100 fold, right? There's the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And, uh, and then you, sometimes you may say, no, I don't want to follow your will. And you blow it, but then you repent. And then he can readjust every electron to give you another chance. I love the word salvation comes from the root word salvage. <laughs> he, can, he can salvage us out of our messes. <laughs> the word redeem means to buy back. He can buy back missed opportunities and b bad words that we said, you know. And, um, and so God is in charge of time. And uh, this allows us to have our free will decisions. But yet he is still in control of everything. There's a third thing. He has to hide himself behind his creation. Because if he ever revealed himself to you in all of his universe creating omnipotent power brighter than a trillion trillion suns, your response, if you didn't melt, would be like the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet as dead. It would be an involuntary response. In the presence of all power, all awesomeness, boom, you'd be down. And God's like, I, I, can, I can do involuntary responses all eternity. He is completely awesome. He goes, but I'm interested in this, I'm interested in this voluntary response. So he has to hide himself behind his creation. People say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself? 
Because the moment he shows himself in all of his glory, your free will's gone. You're going to respond involuntarily. And the same hiding of himself that people say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself, right? But if he shows himself, he is so awesome, you'll respond without thinking about it. It'll be immediate. And the same hiding of himself that allows us to have free will necessitates that we have faith. Two sides of the same coin. Oh, it's so hard to have faith. I wish God would just show himself. Yeah, if he shows himself, you won't need faith anymore, but you won't have a free will anymore. I was trying to think of a way of explaining how God has to hide himself in order for us to be able to love him back and that love to be loved. Imagine a billionaire has a son who goes to college and he flies in on his private jet, drives up in his Lamborghini, He's got a Rolex watch, fancy clothes, gold rings. He's going to have every girl on campus wanting to meet him. But if he lays that aside, drives up in a clunker, he's got holes in his jeans, all the uppity girls are going to ignore him. But then there's a girl that likes to study with him in the library. And they eat together in the cafeteria. And they become friends. And she takes heat from the clique for hanging around this nobody guy. But, but she believes in him. She, she loves him. They get engaged. And then one day he says, hey, I want to take you back to meet my dad. <laughs> and they're like driving up to this castle mansion estate. And the girl, the girl goes, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff. If Jesus would have come in his glory, every political ladder climber, I love you, I love you, sure. No, he's born in a manger. It says in Isaiah 53 of the Messiah, there was nothing in his countenance that would make us want to desire him. He only, he only wants those that love him for him. So God creates us unique in that we have the ability to love him back. He creates time so that we have our free will to love him, but he's still in control of everything. And he hides himself so that we have the opportunity to use our free will. But there's a last thing. He's just. And he cannot help it. He's just. He's a God of rules. Laws of planetary motion, laws of gravity, laws of physics, laws of optics. Everything's laws. And he has laws for human behavior. We just have the choices of whether or not to follow the laws. In mathematical equations, there's constants and variables. In the equation of redemption, the constant is God is just. Was, is, and forever will be just. It'll never change. The variable is who takes the judgment, you or a substitute. Jesus is our substitute. God is just, which means God has to judge every sin. Because if God does not judge a sin, by default, his silence would be giving consent to the sin. It's called the rule of tacit admission, T-A-C-I-T. -T. It's in a wedding ceremony. The pastor says, if you are silent when you hear these vows, your silence is giving consent to the vows, right? Speak now forever, hold your peace. So if there are sins and God is silent and not judging the sin, by default, he would be giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to one sin, one time, he denies his just nature. He denies himself. He ungods himself. He's kicked out of heaven. And he is not going to get kicked out of heaven. And he is not going to deny himself. And he is going to judge every sin. So he could never be loved back. If he creates free will beings that can love him. And he uh, creates time. He's still in control. And he can hide himself so that we can use our free will. But if we step out of line one time, he has to judge us. Because if he doesn't judge us, his silence will be giving consent to the sin. If he gives consent to sin, he denies himself. And he cannot deny himself. So he could never be loved back until he came up with a plan. He actually had the plan before he created the first electron. And the plan was his own son would become a man and only as a man could God hang on a cross and die in judgment for our sins. Charles Wesley wrote the hymn, Amazing Love, How Could It Be That Thou, My God, Shouldst Die For Me. So God is just in that he judges every sin, but he's loving that he provided the lamb to take the judgment for the sin. Abraham and Isaac are going to the top of Mount Moriah. 
Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice. We have the coals for the sacrifice. But where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And it has a double meaning. Trust in God will have the ram up in the bush, but the other is God will provide himself. And that's what happened. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten son of God in the plan of redemption that was hidden from ages. It was a hidden plan. If the princes of this world had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. The apostle Paul called it the mystery of the gospel that was hidden from ages from the foundations of the world, but now it's revealed to the saints. In this hidden plan, Jesus, the son of God, became man and he took the wrath, the judgment of a just God upon himself on the cross in our place. And it says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Jesus experienced that day on the cross as if it was a thousand years. That's why he was sweating drops of blood. You know, I've read the book of Revelation time after time, still trying to figure it out. But one thing seems clear. It's God that is pouring out the vials of judgment. Lamb breaks the seal. Angel throws the center. Angel blows the trumpet. It's like, why is that? Well, that's the final judgment. God is a just God. He has to judge every sin he missed along the way. So you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there was a sin way back when, and you didn't judge it, and you were silent. Were, were you giving consent to that sin? Is there a party that's unjust we didn't know about? Uh-uh. It says the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever, and the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Nobody's going to question for the rest of eternity that God judged sin. But that's the final judgment. God won't do any more judging for the rest of eternity. But in that sense, Jesus had the equivalent of the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. Jesus took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. Experienced it as if it was a thousand years. You know, I have a degree in accounting, so I like things that balance. You take an eternal being, Jesus, who is innocent, suffering for a finite limited period of time. It's equal to all of us finite limited beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say that again. An eternal being that is innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. An unlimited being suffering for a limited period of time is equal to all of us limited beings suffering for an unlimited period of time. Jesus suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places. And he is the only one who could have done it. And out of love for the father and out of love for you and me, he became the lamb. He took the judgment. It says in Isaiah 53 of the Messiah that it pleased the Lord to crush him. The word Gethsemane means olive press. He took the judgment and then he rose from the dead to prove he was who he said he was. This way, you and I can approach this universe creating, omnipotent, all powerful, and all just God without having to worry about being judged. Because all the judgment we deserve went on Christ and we are approaching him through Christ. The Lamb is God's way to love you without having to judge you. It's his plan. He came up with it. That he can love you for the rest of eternity and you can love him back for the rest of eternity. Free will, voluntary, and it's not based on you being good enough. It's based on Jesus being good enough to take the judgment of a just God on himself. And we are approaching God through Jesus. And then he fills us with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And then the Holy Spirit lives in and loves through us, through us, reaching out, sharing the love of God to a hurting world, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, rescuing those unjustly sentenced to death, defending the defenseless, standing up. And there's nothing more exciting than letting the God of the universe live and love through you. You surrender your life. He gives you his life. He lives on the inside of you. He leads you and he guides you. He directs you. So today, the God who controls time, who controls every electron, arranged it for you to be here right now so you would hear 
how much he loves you infinitely. And he has an infinite desire for you to love him back. And it's not based on you being good enough. His own son paid for all your sins. So you're free to love him back. And it's just a call to your heart to respond to his love. So with that, let's go before the Lord in prayer. And just say this prayer under your breath with me. Heavenly Father, you created the universe. You created everything. You created me. And I have sinned. I deserve judgment. But you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross to take the judgment in my place. Jesus, thank you that you shed your blood, you died, you rose from the dead, and now I am risen with you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come in me, live in me forever. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. Love people through me, use me to the glory of God, through Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pastor Scott.